بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الناس انتم الفقراء الى الله والله هو الغني الحميد وقال الله تعالى والله الغني وانتم الفقراء وان تتولوا يستبدل قوما غيركم ثم لا يكونوا امثالكم صدق الله العظيم It was great sitting in brother Rasam's lecture I heard a lot and today was the first time I actually had the chance to hear, sit through one of them I'm happy that alhamdulillah we have imams like um, Brother Wissam and also Brother Kamran, Dr. Kamran, serving the community. It makes us feel happy that Alhamdulillah there is great hope in Chicago and in the United States of America, inshaAllah. He was talking about cupping, very interesting. There's a hadith referred to as Musalsal bil Hijama. Musalsal bil Hijama is that narration that the Sahabi, when he heard this from Rasulullah, he had the cupping done. And then when he narrated the hadith to his student, he had the cupping done. And then when he narrated that hadith to his student, he had the cupping done. And when he narrated it to his student, he had the cupping done. And we were sitting in front of our teacher, and our teacher said that, I narrate this hadith to you, and I've also done this cupping. So ensure that sometime in your life, you do the cupping too. So for many years, I tried and tried and tried, how can I get it done, how can I get it done? We were in Hajj this year, and we found some brothers, they were doing cupping. So a few of us lined up. And one of our friends, he went ahead. I had a phone call, so I had to leave. Later on, we met in the haram, and I looked at his, back, at his neck, and it seemed torn up. The guy did a terrible job. And he was really bruised for so many days, and I was like, okay, you know what, I'm not getting this cupping done. I'll have to hold off a little. Then last weekend, I was actually at a friend's house. Was it two weeks ago? I think two or three weeks ago. In the last few weeks, I was at a friend's house. And they're like, Mufti Sahib, let's do cupping. We just had tea, we're just sitting, let's all get cupping done. I was like, okay, let's do it. So he pulled out his kit, he got one of the bowls, he lit a fire in there, and then he poked me in the back and he stuck it on my back. And I'm like, what are you doing? And I honestly felt nothing at all. Honestly, he just said to me, read Surah Fatiha. And I'm reading Surah Fatiha, and he's done meanwhile. And I'm just sitting there, what's happening? And I'm just sitting there relaxed. After a little while, he put three cups on my back. And when he released all three cups, I would think probably there'd be liquid blood in there. The gathered clotted blood that came out of my back you know what it was equivalent to? Take a guess what it looked like. I mean, forget the color and the blood. Just, what would you compare it to? Jelly. Very good. Honestly, I thought of strawberry jelly. It was actually that thick. And I was thinking to myself that this is sitting in my back? SubhanAllah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions as in the hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari that if a person wishes to get cure done through something, then use hijama as your tool. The hadith is in where? In Sahih al-Bukhari. That if you wish to have your cure done, then have it done through hijama. And honestly, the next day, when I woke up, I, for the few hours I was a little down, really weak. Then the next morning when I woke up, honestly, I felt like two years younger. Right? I mean, like, I'm not so old as it is, but I just felt a little younger. <laughs> From 24, I went back to 22. But alhamdulillah, I feel a little stronger again. But it was good. I mean, it's a, it's a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I think that was beautiful that he bought that fort. I actually took the picture then and posted it up on one of my social sites that I contribute to. And a lot of people, they were like, oh, this is sunnah? And brothers and sisters alike were like, this is a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I never even knew of this. And they said, where did you get it done? So I, I told him a friend of mine that this is a friend of mine. He does it, you can have it done by him. And that friend of mine, like 24 hours later, I emailed him and said, did anyone contact you? He's like, I don't know what happened in the last 24 hours. At least 100 people contacted me. Brothers and sisters alike, and they all want to get a hijama done. And his wife does a hijama for the sisters, and he has it done for the brothers to live in the Chicago land area. So I was really excited and I was encouraging the brothers to go. And I just spoke to Brother Wissam right now and he said he's actually a certified, he's certified to do this cupping, right? And this, that's amazing, subhanAllah. Not public information, sorry, now it's public. Actually, this is a private gathering, so it's not as public. Okay, that's enough talking, let's get back to the topic. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being, he ensured that the human being was left incomplete. Incomplete in the sense that the human being, in order to feel complete, 
will always need the help of another person, another being. For example, look at the brain of a human being. The brain of the human being is the size of a potato. And how much does a person use out of that potato? Probably the size of a date, if even that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear to the human being that I've given you a brain that's the size of a potato, and out of that potato you only use the size of a date. So the remaining part of the brain that's not being fun that's not that you're not actually using, it's a clear sign to you that there's a lot more that you can do, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put boundaries on you, that you should only go so far and not cross your boundaries, otherwise one day you may claim to be the ilah and rabbukum al-a'la. One day you may make such a claim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he puts a boundary on the human being. That there's only so far you should go, there's only so far you should think. It's like the hand, it has five fingers. If a person is missing the thumb, you realize automatically that the optimal use of this hand is not being utilized. How can a person hold a fork? How can a person eat? How can they take a morsel? What can they do without a thumb? How could you throw a ball without a thumb? How could you hold a baseball without a thumb? How could you throw, hold a baseball bat without a thumb? How could you shoot a ball without a thumb? How can a person even fight martial arts without a thumb? I mean, it, it's required in every single, every single movement of our life, the stomach, every single function of our hand, the stomach is required. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it very clear to the human being, oh human being, you will always be faqeer. You will always be faqeer and you will always be dependent. And that's just the way I created you. Ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind, antumul fuqara'u ila Allah, you are dependent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu huwa al-ghaniyyul hamid And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghani, he's independent Al-hamid, he is praiseworthy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of a nation that came before And their statement was that we are independent And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is dependent on us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran Laqad sami Allah Indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has heard Alladheena qalu Those who said Inna Allah faqeer That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is dependent on us and we are independent. We write down what they're saying. Don't think the statement you make will slip past. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you the very opposite. You will never be independent. You will always remain dependent. And times will come in your life as brothers and sisters of the MSA of college, growing up in this society, throughout the world, wherever you are, that you will need help from someone. It may be in your work. It may be in your school. It may be in your marital life. It may be in any sort of way. And when that time comes that you're dependent towards another individual, and when you break down emotionally, physically, mentally, and you're searching for help, you may go to a father, you may go to a mother, you may go to a friend, you may go to a teacher. But remember one thing, that the only way a person can come out of the state of being dependent is by going to one who truly is independent. The only way a person can leave the state of being dependent is by going to one who is truly independent. And that truly independent one is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu al ghani wa antumul fuqara. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is independent, and you will always remain dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa in tatawallaw. And if you can't digest that fact, yastabdil qawman ghayrakum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We will wipe you out. And as the first verse that I recited earlier on, Ya ayyuhan nas antumul fuqara u ila Allah, wallahu huwa al ghani wal hamid. The same point is mentioned there, that if you cannot digest the fact that you are dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in yasha yudhibkum wa ya'ti bi khalqin jadeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so independent that he doesn't need anyone he doesn't need anyone all he needs to do is with one kun and what will happen with one happen he just needs to order a happen kun and what will happen in yasha yudhibkum the entire mankind will be wiped out wa ya'ti bi khalqin jadeed and he will bring a new creation wa ma dhalika ala Allah bi aziz this is nothing hard or difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you think this is hard for Allah, you don't know who your Allah Azza wa Jal is. You, don't have, you have no idea who your Khalik and your Malik and your Rabb Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْا And if you turn away, يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring a new nation. ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُ أَمْثَالَكُمْ And tomorrow no one will even use an example of you. No one will even remember you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that you will always be dependent. And you will always need help. And whenever you search for this help, you will always search for someone who can help you. You will always go to someone who can assist you. But remember one thing, that the world and every single creation in this world, the trees, the leaves, the animals, the birds, the fishes, whatever is below the ocean, whatever is below the ground, whatever is in the skies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created and we have no idea of. All of this creation, until the point that the creation that is beyond our imagination, beyond the world, if there's anything that exists out there, 
the relationship of the mother and the child, every single act of mercy we have ever seen is only 1% out of the 100 of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people in the world can only help you to what degree? 1%. How much can they help you? How far can they help you? Only 1%. That's as far as mercy they can show you. The mother to her child, the father to his child, the husband to the wife, the wife to the husband, brother to sister, teacher to student, doctor to patient, or however far you wish to take this. Any mercy that has been shown in history from the beginning of mankind, from the beginning of makhluk, let me take that beyond that, from the beginning of makhluk, from the beginning of creation, ila ma until the end of time, will always be only 1% of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the human being at some point will try to deny this. He will think or she will think that they can find help from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will go house to house, door to door, country to country, college to college, seeking for this help and looking for this help. But then what happens is, the definite is what happens. And what's definite, what's for sure, is that that person will remain unsatisfied. And true help will never be sought by this person. Until the person comes, lowering himself, with tears full in their eyes, complete humbleness in their heart, dressed as a servant is when he comes to the house of the master. And when the person comes to the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the feeling will come in his heart. And the thought will come in their mind. And that joy will gush in every vein of that individual's body when they stand in front of the, the, the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they come to the door of Allah, they will realize that this is where I started from. This is where mercy is because the mankind only has 1%. The creation only has 1%. Now it's time to enter into the 99 portions of mercy that still remain within the house of Allah. And now what happens is the person opens the door and he takes his right foot and he puts it inside. And what's the dua that he recites then? What's the dua that you recite when you enter into the masjid? Allahumma ftahli abuwaba rahmatik. Oh Allah, it's time to open up the doors to your mercy. And that person opens up the door. And he enters inside the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the hadith, the dua the, the doesn't say, Allahumma fahli baba rahmatik. It doesn't say, oh Allah, open the door to your mercy. What does it say? Abawaba. What is abwab? It's a plural. That, oh Allah, open the doors to your mercy. Because as Brother Wissam was mentioning earlier on, the masjid does not only have one function. There is not only one way to gain the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The masjid is a central point of the community. The masjid is the central point of the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Inna awwala baytin, wudhi'a linnas, lalladhi bi bakkata, mubarakan, wa hudallil alameen, fihi ayatun, bayyinatun, maqam Ibrahim, wa man dakhalahu, kana amina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, the first house that was ever created on the face of this earth is where? Where is it? Bi bakka, in Makkah mukarramah. And what is the beauty of that house? Fihi ayatun, bayyinat. When a person steps inside the house of Allah, he sees the signs there. And what are the signs? There is sakina there. There is this calmness there. There is a continuity of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showering down in that house. When you enter inside the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what happens? Tears begin to gush out of your eyes. What happens? The Quran is opened up. What happens? The tasbih comes out. What happens? The remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala falls onto the tongue. What happens? The head is lowered. The hands are raised. And what happens then? The tongue is closed. The heart begins to speak. And the person begins to say, Ya Allah, Oh Allah, Allahumma gfirli, Allahumma arhamni, Allahumma tuba alayya, Oh Allah, have mercy on me. Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, accept my repentance. Allahumma la malja'a wa la manja'a minka illa ilayka ya rabbal alameen. Oh Allah, there is nowhere to run. Oh Allah, there is nowhere to hide. Oh Allah, there is nowhere to seek refuge but at your door. Ilahi, ilahi ya rabbal alameen. Oh my Lord, qad danabtu. Oh Allah, I have committed sins. And today, I have returned back to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Quran, verse after verse, he tells us, ilayya al masir that it will, the return will be back to me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ilayya al-anab, to me you will have to return back. Time after time we see in the Quran, we see in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, of which this entire seminar and conference is set up, سَبَعَةٌ يُذِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ذِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّ There are seven individuals who will be granted a place in the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day in which there will be no other shade beside the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me tell you one thing. When I read this hadith as a student, this hadith meant nothing to me at all. The first time I understood the meaning of this hadith, let me tell you, and I'm being honest to you, was this last Ramadan. 
This last Ramadan, when I had the opportunity to finally leave my community and spend this Ramadan in Haramain, inside Makkah Mukarramah, Medina Munawwara, that was the first time I understood two hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first one was in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that, Oh Allah, make your love more beloved to me min ma'il barid. Then, cold water. I always thought to myself that why is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that make your love more beloved to me, O oh Allah, than cold water. I mean, what an example. Cold water out of all of the things in the world. I mean, it meant nothing to me at all. That hadith was just something that, one of those things I never understood. It's like I was mentioning in my last lecture. As a child, while reading the Quran, I never understood the meaning of the verse, yudillu bihi kathira wa yahdi bihi kathira. I always thought, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do idran and misguide someone through the Quran? It never made sense to me. Then I explained it in the last lecture. I won't do that all, all over again. Okay, so this was another one of those ahadith that I always thought to myself, that why is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa comparing the love of Allah with cold water? And the second thing I never understood was the meaning of this hadith. That on that day of judgment, there will be no shade but the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I understood both things, guess how? We were fasting. It was the month of Ramadan. We were living in a hotel that was a little far away from the haram. And the part of haram that we would enter in through, Bab Malik Abdul Aziz, had no air conditioning there at all. There's no air conditioning there. In the Makkah Mukarramah, the Haram, the air conditioning is in Bab Malik Fahd. That's the new part of the masjid, the new extension. I, my, one of my friends who traveled with us from Chicago this year for Hajj, he was telling me that his country, his company has taken the contract from Milwaukee to actually do the air conditioning for the entire Haram, inshallah, very soon. They're finalizing it, inshallah, on Aziz. So, khair, so when I entered into that door, it was so hot, the temperature was 112 degrees. How hot was it? You actually see steam coming off your sweat. It's evaporating in front of you, and you're like trying to move your hand away from yourself. I don't want that steam on me. So you're walking in, it's so hot. Just from the hotel until I reached the haram, we would be thirsty. I felt my, my throat sticking together. I couldn't even breathe properly. And then when we would reach inside, by the time we'd go back from Dohar Salah, when I reached back home, I would say to my roommates, I don't even know if I have the energy. If I, Islamically, if I'm required to go pray asr in the haram, I would be so knocked out and so destroyed from the, from the, from the effect of the weather. And then when Maghrib Salah time would come, after Asr Salah, um, we, when Maghrib Salah time would come, we'd sit, by, we'd sit down in the haram and they would be serving water and dates to everyone for their iftar, for breaking the fast. And in front of my eyes, I saw people. That there's five minutes left for iftar and they have five cups of water in front of them and the person sitting there like this for two minutes before. <laughs> like this. The uncle's obviously sitting there like this. Two minutes before, just waiting. The adhan goes and he's dropping it. And in front of my eyes, one brother was sitting there like this with water to drink water because it was so hot. And he didn't make it till the Adhan. He fainted, he fell on the ground. Allahu Alam, what happened to him, hopefully, I'm sure he didn't, you know, I'm sure he, he, he made it through, but, you know, it was, it was terrifying. I was thinking, wow, subhanAllah. And then when iftar, what happened? When I would drink that water, that hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu came to my mind. That, oh Allah, make your love more beloved to me than cold water. And the second hadith I learned was this hadith, سَبَعَةٌ يُذِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ظِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّهُ That seven people will be granted the shade from the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day in which there will be no other shade. When I was walking around the Kaaba, it was extremely packed. It was hot. After Dhuhr Salah time, we were doing our tawaf. We were inside our ihram. And while we were walking, while we were walking, the sun was right above us after Dhuhr Salah time. There was no shade in the mataf at all while we were performing the tawaf until finally what happened, we gained our way, we made our way close to the Kaaba and we found the shade of the Kaaba and we sat there for a little bit. And when I sat in the shade of the, of the Kaaba, I said, SubhanAllah, today I understood that hadith. سَبْعَةٌ يُذِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ظِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّ وَمِنْهُمْ رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسْجِدِ And amongst those people, the people who will be granted a place in the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one whose heart is attached to the masjid. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُ الْعَبْدَ يَعْتَادُ إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ فَاشْهَدُوا لَهُ بِالْإِيمَانِ who is frequent to the masjid. Ya ta'adu ila al-masjid. He's always visiting the masjid. What should you do? Fashhadu lahu bil iman. Testify this man as a believer because he's spending his day in the mercy of Allah. He's asking Allah, Allahumma ftah li abwa ba rahmatik. Allahumma ftah li abwa ba rahmatik. He's sitting in the middle of mercy. And the mercy is showering upon this person. How could you doubt that this person is not complete in his faith? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says one hadith, right? As Imam Tabrani rahmatullah alayhi relates in his awsat. Man alif al-masjid. Man alif al masjidah, alif Allah. Right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Whoever befriends the masjid, man alif al masjid, the one who befriends the masjid, 
Alifahu Allahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala befriends that person. Subhanallah, look at these ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam, Imam Hakim rahmatullah alayhi, Ibn Hibban, Ibn Khuzayma rahmatullahi alayhi. In their sahih, they relate a very, a very beautiful hadith in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the one who frequents the masjid, brother or sister, the one who frequents the masjid and is active within the roles of the masjid, this person, the one who frequents the masjid, so like in all the time he's in the masjid, all the time he or she is in the masjid, trying to serve the community, trying to serve the masjid, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the best of their ability. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so pleased when that person puts their foot inside the masjid. He becomes so happy when that person steps in the masjid, just as the family becomes happy when their relatives, when their husband returns back from a very long trip. You know when you return back from a very long trip and the entire family is waiting for you at the airport and they have balloons and they have roses for you with the Indian culture, right? They throw the hat over your head and they're all waiting for you. They're really excited, right? I know my, when I used to return back from trips, my mom used to do some really interesting stuff. Yeah, she used to put the hat on my head and after putting the, the roses on my head, she used to crack her knuckles on my head too. You ever seen that, the knuckle cracker? <laughs> she used to crack her knuckles on my head and that meant that now I was safe and I was home now and I felt like I was home when that happened. So, when a person is so excited by seeing a relative after being departed and, and, and kept away for so long, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the one who frequents the masjid, when he enters into the masjid, I also feel that happiness and I also feel so happy to see that individual. However, there's one thing I want to mention. I believe my time is coming to an end. I just want to read one more hadith followed by one more point, inshaAllah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says one hadith as narrated by Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala in his sahih. Whoever wishes to have iman on the day of judgment, Whoever wishes to have his faith, has his, have his iman on the day of judgment, have his or her brother or sister, have their iman on the day of judgment, let them attend the call of prayer. Where is the call being made from? The masjid. So they have to attend the call of prayer. And Rasulullah in this very same hadith, he continues to say, do not be like the mutakhallifin, those who stay behind from prayer. And Rasulullah says, and do not pray your salah at home alone without a reason. This is for the men. And if you begin to pray your salah at home like a man, لَتَرَبْتُمْ سُنَّةَ نَبِيِّكُمْ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying this. Who's making the statement? Nabi Allah is making the statement. لَتَرَبْتُمْ سُنَّةَ نَبِيِّكُمْ If you start praying your salah at home and the masjids are empty, you no longer are following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَوْ تَرَبْتُمْ سُنَّةَ نَبِيِّكُمْ And if you abandon the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لَذَرَلْتُمْ You will be misguided. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us of a time, that a time will come that if Muslims are not attending the masjid, what will happen to the masjid? Will the masjid ever remain, ever remain a place of education? If the Muslims are not attending the masjid, can the masjid ever remain a social place? Will the masjid ever be a place where Muslims meet one another and become a, a strong kalbunyan, like a strong structure? Will the day ever happen that the Muslims will ever know each other? One day I turned around to my congregation after Fajr Salah, and I said to them that I've been here Imam for three years, and I wish to see one person stand up and name all the people in the front cells. And there wasn't one person who could stand up, who can name every individual sitting there. It's as if we're together, but we're not there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that stand together. Straighten your lines, stand in line together. Because if you do that, Allah will join your heart. Be together as a team. The help of Allah is with the group. And the one who decides to run away from the group and stay in his corner, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pick that person up. And right in the fire of hell that person goes. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that if you abandon the masjid, the masjid, the focal point of the community, the focal point of the, of the, Muslim, cent the, the Muslim center, the Muslim hub of the entire society of the, and the, of the entire city will no longer be of any power. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says one thing. And with this hadith, I'll end my discussion. And he's saying this hadith in front of the Sahaba. And when he's narrating this hadith in front of the Sahaba, the Sahaba Allah ta'ala ajma'een are shocked. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is prophesizing. And he says, وَهُوَ سَيُّدُ الصَّادِقِينَ he says, well, he has never lied in his entire life. Yati alan nasi zamanun. A time will come. He's prophesying while sitting in Medina Munawwara, in the perfect community, in the perfect city. And he's saying, Yati alan nasi zamanun. A time will come, my dear companions. La yabqa min al Islam illa smuhu. The only thing that will remain from this religion is its name. Wa la yabqa min al Quran illa rasmuhu. The only thing that will remain from the Quran is its text. Masajiduhu ma'aminatun. The masajid will be constructed, very nice. وَهِيَ خَرَابٌ مِّنَ الْهُدَىٰ But there will be no guidance from there at all. وَلَمَاؤُهُمْ شَرٌ مِّنْ تَحْتَ أَدِيمِ السَّمَاءِ The scholars on the face of the earth will be the worst people. مِنْ عِنْدِهِمْ تَخْرُجُ الْفِتْنَةِ 
The fitna will start from them, وَفِيهِمْ ثَعُودِ And the fitna will return right back to them. These people will distort the deen. They will name themselves as scholars, but change the deen. And the masajid will be nice structured walls, nice big buildings. We were talking about this earlier on, that the masjid of Rasulullah was based on date palm trees. The roof was the, were the branches of the trees. The Sahaba, when they would go into sajda, they would remove the stones. They asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, if we move the stones in salah while going in sajda, is that permitted? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, move it once, not twice. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is giving the khutbah and he's saying that man laha fil khutbah falaysa laha jumaah. The one who plays with stones during the khutbah, there is no jumaah for him. Was he sitting on a nice plush carpet? The masjid was so simple. The masjid was weak. The men were solid. The masjid has gone solid. The men have gone weak. That's the reality of today's, of today's situation. That's the reality of today's situation. So, and as, as a closing point, we need to ensure as a next generation, brothers and sisters alike, that we hold on to our masajid. We hold on to our community centers. We abandon them, we will no longer have a center of knowledge. We will no longer have a center of life. If we populate these masajids, we are the ones that attend the salah. We are the ones that are calling on to them, are, are replying to the call of the muaddin. And the muaddin isn't just you know, lamely saying, Hayya al salah, Hayya al falah, and the, and the masjid is crying, but who's coming and who's not coming? If we are the people that answer that call, inshaAllah, trust me, we will see a change in our community. And we will see our masajid not only as structures, but as places of guidance, as candles, of, as lanterns that the entire world in darkness and these masajid will be places of lights. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to act on what has been said. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from me what has been said. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this conference, accept those who put this conference together, and accept all the attendees and the speakers alike. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa natubu ilaika wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.